Hello, and welcome to the This Happened Today in History podcast. I am your host, Mr. Miller. This podcast will cover a number of topics that happened on this date in history. Please visit the podcast webpage at thishappentoday.buzzsprout.com. There you can download the notes page, which will help you organize the information, as well as develop your own ideas on how these events change the world around us. If you're interested in hearing more, please consider subscribing so you will not miss out on what happens tomorrow in history. Today is June 23rd. In 1989, Tim Burton's noir spin on the well-known story of the DC Comics hero Batman was released into theaters. Michael Keaton starred in the film as the multi-millionaire Bruce Wayne who has transformed himself into the crime-fighting Batman after witnessing his parents' brutal murder as a child. As the film's actions begin, mob henchman Jack Napier, Jack Nicholson, is gruesomely disfigured after Batman inadvertently drops him in a vat of acid during a standoff in a chemical factory. After killing his boss, Jack Palance, Napier, now known as the Joker, goes on loose in Gotham City, wreaking havoc and trying to turn its people against the Cape Crusader. When Batman's affection for a beautiful newspaper reporter, Vicki Vale, Kim Basinger, is, re- is revealed, the Joker uses her to draw his rival out in the open with dramatic results. Controversy had surrounded the casting of Keaton, best known for comedies like 1983's Mr. Mom, as Batman. An entire roster of prominent leading men, in- reportedly including Mel Gibson, Dennis Quaid, Harrison Ford, and Kevin Costner, were considered for a ro- the role and Burton reportedly wanted to cast an unknown actor a la Christopher Reeve in Superman. Having worked previously with Keaton and Beetlejuice in 1988, Burton liked the idea of collaborating with him again, and the producers agreed. After screening Keaton's 1988 film, Clean and Sober, the Keaton had a talent as a serious actor as well. In a new marketing strategy that would become a trend for movies featuring superheroes, Warner Brothers hyped Batman as a major summer event long before its release. The results were stunning as the film grossed some $100 million in its first 10 days of release, including $82.8 million at the domestic box office alone. Reviews for the film were mixed, though most critics praised Nicholson's on-scene-stealing performance as the Joker. For his creation of the movie Impressive Batmobile in the dark, cavernous Gotham City, Batman's producer-designer Anton First won an Oscar for Best Art Direction, Set Direction. Burton's second film, Batman film, The Batman Returns in 1989, also starred Keaton as a Cape Crusader. Most critics consider the sequel, also a box office hit, to be a better movie than its predecessor. Warner Brothers, seeking even greater commercial success for the franchise, hired hired Joe Schumacher to direct the next installment, Batman Forever, in 1995, which starred Val Kilmer as Batman. Tommy Lee Jones and Jim Carrey were villains in that film, while Nicole Kidman was a love interest and Chris O'Donnell came on as Robin. Batman's sidekick. Kilmer, like Keaton before him, left the franchise before the making of the next planned film because he felt Batman was getting less attention than his enemies. George Clooney took his place for Schumacher's Batman and Robin in 1997, which was roundly panned by critics. A few years later, the director Christopher Nolan reoriented the series, going back to Bruce Wayne's childhood for Batman Begins in 2005, starring Christian Bale in the tight role. Nolan and Bale returned in 2008 for the sequel The Dark Knight, which featured a stunning turn by Heath Ledger, who was found dead of an accidental prescription drug overdose soon after filming was completed, as the Joker. The third and final installment was The Dark Knight Rises 2012, also a critical and commercial success. Batman later appeared in several DC Extended Universe films, including Batman vs. Superman, Dawn of Justice 2016, starring Ben Affleck as the Cape Crusader. Second, the Winnie Mae, a special Lockheed Model 5C Vega flown by famed aviator Wiley Post, completed two around-the-world record flights in a series of special high-altitude substratospheric research flights. It was named for the daughter of its original owner, F.C. Hall, who hired Post to pilot the plane. With the consent of his employer, Post entered the Winnie Mae in the national air races and piloted the plane to the first of its records, now inscribed in the side of its fuselage, Los Angeles to Chicago, 9 hours, 9 minutes, 4 seconds, August 27, 1930. On June 23, 1931, Post began an around-the-world flight to try to bring prestige to the United States by shattering the previous 21-day record set by German airship Graf Zeppelin. Post lacked training in most navigational techniques and selected Harry Gaddy, Harold Gaddy as his navigator. The Tasmanian board Getty was the chief instructor for the Weems system of navigation and regarded by many as the most capable air navigator in the nation. 
Getty utilized the tools and techniques of the Weem system for the flight, including his prototype drift meter, which became highly successful in later forms. Getty occupied the main cabin and Post had a hatch installed in the cabin ceiling above behind the wing spar so Getty could make his celestial observations. On July 15, 1933, Post left New York City, closely followed his former route, but only making 11 stops. He circled the world in 7 days, 18 hours, and 49 minutes. Post knew no more about navigation in 1933 than in 1931, so his decision to go solo without a navigator was far riskier. Fortunately, both the radio compass and autopilot worked flawlessly, and he completed the flight with minimal trouble. Post next modified the Winnie Mae for long-distance, high-altitude operation. He recognized the need to develop some means of enabling the pilot to operate in a cabin atmosphere of greater density with outside atmospheric environment. Because of its design, Winnie Mae could not be equipped with a pressure cabin. Post therefore asked the B.F. Goodrich Company to assist him in developing a pressure suit for the pilot. Post hoped that by equipping the plane with an engine supercharger and jettisonable landing gear and himself with a pressure suit, he could cruise for long distances at high altitude in the jet stream. On March 15th of 1935, Post flew from Burbank, California to Cleveland, Ohio, a distance of 2,035 miles in 7 hours and 19 minutes. At times, the Winnie Mae attained, attained ground speed of 340 miles per hour, indicating that the plane was indeed operating in the jet stream. Wiley Post died shortly afterward in a crash of a hybrid Lockheed Orion Cirrus float plane near Point Barrow, Alaska on August 15, 1935. His companion, humorist Will Rogers, also perished in the accident. The Smithsonian Institution acquired the Winnie Mae from Mrs. Post in 1936. During its high-altitude flight research, the Winnie Mae made use of special tubular steel landing gear developed by Lockheed engineers Clarence Kelly Johnson and James Gersler. It was released after takeoff by the pilot using the cockpit lever, thus reducing the total drag of the plane and eliminating its weight. The Winnie Mae could then continue on its flight and land on a special metal-covered spruce landing skid glued to the fuselage. During these flights, Post wore the world's first practical pressure suit in an important step on the road to human space travel. The suit was a third type developed by Post and Russell Colley of the B.F. Goodrich Company. It consisted of three layers, long underwear, an inner black rubber air pressure bladder, and an outer contoured cloth suit. A pressure helmet was then bolted onto the suit. It had a removable faceplate Post could seal when he reached an altitude of 17,000 feet. The helmet had an oxygen system and could accommodate earphones and a throat microphone. The suit could withstand an internal pressure of 7 pounds per square inch. Bandolera type cords prevented the helmet from rising as the suit was pressurized. A liquid oxygen container containing of a double-walled vacuum bottle utilized the natural boil-off tendencies of super-cold liquid oxygen to furnish gaseous oxygen for the suit pressurization and breathing purposes. This early full-pressure suit is the direct ancestor of full-pressure suits used in the X-15 research airplane and manned space voyages. The Winnie Mae, is, its jettisonable landing gear and post-pressure suit are in the collection of the National Air and Space Museum. And then finally, in 1961, the Antarctic Treaty entered into force. It was the first international treaty to ban nuclear testing amongst other military activities within a specified region. The Antarctic Treaty holds the distinction of being the first international treaty established during the Cold War that included substantial arms control provisions. From Article 5 of the Antarctic Treaty, any nuclear explosions in Antarctica shall be prohibited. The Antarctic Treaty's main aims are to de demilitarize the continent, to promote international scientific cooperation, and to set aside disputes over territorial sovereignty. The Protocol on Environment Protection to the Antarctic Treaty designates Antarctica as a natural reserve devoted to peace and science, and bans the exploration and exploitation of oil and natural gas fields found in the Ross Sea. The treaty applies to the area south of 60 degrees south latitude, including all ice shelves and islands. The Antarctic Treaty is a unique example of international cooperation. Its main focus is to ensure that Antarctica is used for the peaceful purposes only. United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki-moon in the 50th anniversary of the Antarctic Treaty. As of June 2012, 48 states had joined the Antarctic Treaty. Any U.S. nation's member state can join the Antarctic Treaty by adhering to its provisions. The Antarctica Treaty also contributes indirectly to banning nuclear testing elsewhere. 13 of the 337 international monitoring system stations of the network being established in the Preparatory Commission for the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization are being established there. 
They represent three of the four verification technologies used to monitor the globe for nuclear explosions. The extreme remoteness and climactic conditions make the operation and maintenance of these stations particularly challenging. An example is the infrasound station IS-55. There are few places on Earth where there has never been a war, where the environment is fully protected, and where scientific research has priority, from the British Antarctic Survey. You have been listening to the This Happened Today in History podcast. I thank you for listening, and I hope that you have enjoyed learning about historical events from the past. Thank you to the following websites for their information regarding today's topics. ThePeople'sHistory.com Batman Movie and History.com, the Round the World Record at timeandnavigation.si.edu, and Antarctica, the Antarctic Treaty System at ctbto.org. The music used as the background track for this podcast is Americana, created by Kevin McLeod on Incompetech.com. If you enjoyed this information and would like to hear more, please consider subscribing as this will keep the historical events in your feed in the morning for each day. I hope you have a great day.